Hello, brethren. It is good to be with you once again. We continue our study in the book of James. We find ourselves in chapter 5, the last chapter, and James is going to conclude this chapter with words of condemnation, comfort, and encouragement. To begin, verses 1 through 6, a condemnation of the rich. Let's read it and then consider it. Chapter 5, verse 1. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded, and their corrosion will be a witness against you, and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out. And the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Seboeth. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in a day of slaughter. You have condemned. You have murdered the just. He does not resist you. That's kind of harsh. Who is he talking to? There's a lot of opinions on that. Um, many believe that he's writing to rich people who are Christians in the assembly. And many believe that he's writing to rich people outside of the assembly, just in the world. I believe it is the second. The reason I believe that, I will give you the reason, one, there is a condemnation, but there's no call to repentance. Notice the next verse, verse 7. Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. Now we know the coming of the Lord is the day of judgment, and he's just given condemnation of these people. Well, if these rich people that are being condemned in the first six verses were brethren, there would be a call to repentance. There would be an appeal. But instead, there's a contrast saying, since that's the fate of the rich, of the world, you, brethren, different groups, you be patient, endure, knowing that judgment is coming. Okay? So that's one reason I believe he's talking about the rich of the world. Now, part of the reason that people struggle with that is this is a letter written to Christians. So why would there be a note in it to people who are not Christians, who are in the world, how are they going to know about it? Well, if you look at the book of Isaiah, the book of Isaiah and many other prophets are filled with condemnations of the nations around Israel. Um, Isaiah chapters 13 through 21 is just a, a, a circle of um, uh, Ammon, you're going to be punished. Moab, you're going to be punished. Edom is going to be punished. The Philistines are going to be punished. Tyre and Sidon are going to be punished going all around. It's not like they were going to read it. Uh, the book of Obadiah, the doom of Edom. Well, the Edomites were probably not going to read that. So why would that be in the Bible? Well, because it was written to God's people to comfort them that Edom, who had done them such wrong, was going to be judged and going to be punished. And there's a comfort in that. There's a comfort in the fact that justice is going to be done and then there's the comfort of those who wronged you or are going to be wronged. Um, compare that to what we read in 2 Thessalonians when Paul starts by saying, um, it is a righteous thing with God to trouble the people who have troubled you and to give you rest with us. So a word of condemnation is how this chapter begins, and yet that would be a word of comfort, thus the therefore of verse 7. So, a condemnation of the rich, because remember, turn back to chapter 2, when he was telling them not to hold Christianity with favoritism, look at verse 6, have you, but you have dishonored the poor man, do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts, do they not blaspheme the noble name by which you are called? Again, if those were Christians, they wouldn't be blaspheming the name of Christ. Um, so it appears to be these people outside. And 
so to continue with that in chapter five, he says, and these people are going to be condemned. You see, you know the things that they're doing, the wickedness, they're going to receive their punishment. Let's compare verses two and three with what our Lord said. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. This is one of those similar teachings we noted in the beginning of our study of James writing with the words of our Lord. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21, Jesus made this very same statement of don't put your trust in gold because gold will eventually corrode. It will eventually rust. Gold won't rust, but iron will rust. Uh, don't uh, put your, your heart, set your heart on having special garments because moths will come in and eat that eventually. They will, everything physical will pass away. So don't tie yourself to the things that are physical. He also warned them about um, trying to serve God and money. No, if you're going to serve money, here's the result. The corrosion of your money is going to be a condemnation of you because this is what you trusted in. Well, there you go. Um, talked about heaping up treasure in the last days. Remember what Jesus said in chapter 6. He said, the treasure of your heart, make it God. Don't make it stuff on this earth because where your heart is, that's your treasure. And that's what you're going to receive. And if you want to receive that which is going to pass away, that's what John himself said in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. Remember he said the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, all that stuff, fine, that's of the world. And it's passing away but the man with God abides forever. So very similar messages to uh, what our Lord said and what's elsewhere in the Bible. Look at verse five. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in a day of slaughter. That's very similar to Jesus's description of um, the rich man when he talked about the rich man and Lazarus in Luke chapter 16. Nineteen through thirty-one, but here the language is: You have lived in pleasure and luxury; you have fattened your hearts. Notice what he said here to the rich man, verse twenty-five. But Abraham said, "Son, speaking to the rich man, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and you are tormented." Turn back to nineteen. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple fine linen, fared sumptuously every day, and at his gate there was a beggar, right? Desiring to only be fed from the crumbs that fell from his table. Uh, Abraham says, well, that's how you had it in life, but you weren't with God, so now that you've died, he who seemed to have nothing in life, Lazarus, he has, Lazarus, he has everything. You who seem to have everything in life, now without God, dead, you have nothing but torment. That's the same message here in James giving comfort to Christians that were being oppressed by the rich by reminding them of the fate of the rich outside of Christ. Remember, there's nothing wrong with being rich. It's a challenge, right? It's easier for a, a camel to walk through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get to heaven because those riches tend to draw your attention and your fixation upon them. Um, in the book of Ecclesiastes, the rich man is always worried about his money. He can't sleep very well because he's always thinking about his money. That doesn't mean you can't be rich in a person of God. Abraham was exceedingly wealthy. Okay, You just have to understand that the source of your riches is God and to give back and to try and do good with your riches. It's a challenge. It's not impossible. Finally, look at verse 6. You have con condemned... You have murdered the just, he does not resist you. Now, there's also, there's a lot of textual variance uh, with that. Um, I'm going to just take it as uh, it is presented. 
why would the just, the Christians who are being oppressed by the rich, why do they not resist you? Well, there's an aspect of the teaching of Christianity. Um, in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 39, Jesus taught about if you take a slap on the cheek, you turn the other cheek. He's not talking about a right cross. He's talking about an insult. If you're being insulted, don't rise to that and don't fight because of that. Instead, turn the other cheek. Don't let it bother you. It's not important in the big scheme of things. We are to be peacemakers and try to, to do good. Don't repay evil with evil, right? But repay evil with good, Romans uh, 12. And so that idea of turning the other cheek in Isaiah 53 and verse 7, uh, speaking of the Christ to come, as the sheep is silent before the shearers, so will the Messiah be. And in Matthew 26, 63, Jesus reached a point where he realized there was no point talking anymore. They weren't listening. They were going to kill him no matter what. So he stopped talking, fulfilling that prophecy and showing the wisdom. There are times to speak and there are times not to speak. And when the courts allow rich people to take your stuff, what are you going to do? Are you going to start a war? Well, Christianity would probably say, you shouldn't do that. You need to just deal with what you have to deal with. Knowing what? The rich are going to get theirs, ultimately. Now, we should strive for just laws and to live in a just country. <clears throat> but most of the history of Christianity, that hasn't been the case. They've lived in corrupt, um, even Israel. What's much of the condemnation in the minor prophets of Israel is that the rich were taking advantage of the poor. Well, that's as old as mankind. Well, if the law supports that, you have to be taken advantage of. And if that sounds hard, remember the admonition in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 7. This was a discrepancy inside the church where one brother was taking another brother to court to get his stuff. They were fighting in the public courts among themselves. And Paul condemns them and says, what are you doing? You're blaspheming the church. You're making the church not look good. We're supposed to be epitomized by love and, and you're showing the world division and fighting. Just the opposite. And he recommends that brethren, if you're being taken advantage of, it would be better for you to allow yourself to be taken advantage of than to cause the church to be seen in a bad light. So I think all of those things together help us to explain that he does not resist you. There are some who think that he should be God, that it's talking uh, about God is allowing this to happen. I, I, I guess it's possible. Uh, anything that happens in a sense, God has allowed. But I think in the context, it's a condemnation of the rich of the world, and it's giving comfort to that he who's not resisting because he's trying to walk like Christ. <clears throat> Second section, verses 7 through 12. Since that's the fate of the rich, the wicked oppressor, Christians should patiently endure. Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. Okay, These are Christians being persecuted, specifically in this context here, being persecuted by the rich. He just told them what the fate is of that those rich if they don't change their ways. And he says, therefore, be patient. Verses 7 uh, and 8, be patient, waiting patiently. Be patient. The word here is different than the word in chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. The word here is macrothumia, literally long-spirited. 
having a great spirit. Um, attitude maybe doesn't go far enough in describing it, but when you put it together with the, the Greek word hupomone, which was in chapter one, remember, translated patient, let patience have its perfect work in you. That means, hupomone means to stay under the load. Here, we have the conclusion of, and stay zealous. Not only are Christians to stay and keep being Christians, but don't lose your zeal. Don't lose your joy. How often do we read, therefore I do not lose heart, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Paul talks about all the persecution the apostles were facing, and he says, but we do not lose heart. Why? And then he goes and lists all the wonderful things that we have in Christ. Same here. We have this wonderful message of keep on keeping on and don't lose your joy. Don't lose heart. Stay zealous for the Lord. Um, in verse 7, there's the reference to the farmer. Again, just as the farmer is patient, right? He does his work, he plants his seed, and then what? And he has to wait. He has to wait for the, I'm going to say fruit, but you understand what I'm saying, the crop to come up. He's got to wait for the fruit to come. Same with the Christian. We are to be patient, do the work that we're supposed to do, but we have to wait on the Lord. We have to trust in God that all will come at its appropriate time and justice will be done. It's kind of like in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 6. There we're told that the farmer is to be the first one to partake of the crop, right? And Christians are to be like that. If we're going to be Christians, we better act Christians right away. We're supposed to be the first ones um, to have that crop. Here, it's the patience of the farmer that's being admonished. And we are to understand that as part of being a Christian is we face persecution. And like a, Christ, a farmer... Um, we're going to be the first ones to face that persecution. And like a farmer, we have to patiently wait upon our Lord, knowing that, 1 Corinthians 15, 58, nothing done for the Lord is in vain. Like the farmer, I've done all the work, I've planted good seed, I just simply wait for my crops to come up. <clears throat> Verses 10 and 11 my brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You've heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. Very similar to Jesus, right? In Matthew chapter 5, 10 through 12, remember he said that blessed are you if you're persecuted for my sake. Wow. I'm, I'm happy if I'm persecuted? How did James begin? Count it all joy when you encounter various trials. How? By understanding, like he just said, that the wicked who oppress you are going to be punished. And you who are being oppressed are going to be exalted and rewarded. That will see you through, right? Jesus, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame. Why? Because of the joy that he knew was going to come, the salvation that he was providing for his. We too, like the prophets, we have to understand it's what happens to Christians. It's what happens to God's people. I mean, the first, second generation of God's people, what happened? Cain killed Abel. Why? Well, the Hebrews author, or Hebrews author? No, I think it's in 1 John. 1 John tells us that the reason Cain killed Abel was because Abel was righteous. <laughs> You shouldn't kill people, but that's what happens. So just like what happened to the prophets, that's what's going to happen to us. Count yourself blessed, just like we count the prophets as blessed. Third section, verses 12 through 18. A Proverbs-like list of instructions for Christians pursuing Christ-likeness. Remember when we talked about this book, some call it the Proverbs of the New Testament. And here's that section that definitely calls that out. Verses 12 through 18. But above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no, no, lest you fall into judgment. 
Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. So there's a list of do these things. This is what we are to be about, right? Starts with the, in verse 12, with this idea of swearing either by heaven or earth. Now, we really don't have that much going on in our culture nowadays. We don't say, you know, uh, I swear by Jove, I will give you, you know, $50 tomorrow. Uh, we tend not to do that. We, we do swear in the courtroom, right? Put our hand on our Bible, I swear, um, uh, so help me God, right? That I'll do, I'm telling the truth. Um, but pretty common New Testament admonition against such swearing. Uh, and the reason was the games that were being played and can be played with this. If you turn back <coughs> to Matthew 5, James repeats almost exactly what our Lord said. Matthew chapter 5, 34 through 37. Jesus said, the Sermon on the Mount, But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your yes be yes and your no, no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. Well, if I'm not telling the truth, let God strike me down. I, I'm suddenly telling God what to do. I have no power to, to make God do anything. So such swearing is evil. It is of the evil one. And remember, there were games being played by this. How do I know that? Well, turn to Matthew 23. Jesus calls them out in that chapter of the woes unto the religious leaders. Look at verse 16 of Matthew 23. Jesus says, Woe to you, blind guides, who say, Whoever swears by the temple, it is nothing. But whoever swears by the gold of the temple, he is obliged to perform it. Fool and blind, for which is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold? And whoever swears by the altar, it is nothing. But whoever swears by the gift that is on it, he is obliged to perform it. Fools and blind, for which is greater, the gift of the altar, or excuse me, the gift or the altar that sanctifies the gift. Therefore, he who swears by the altar swears by it and by all things on it. He who swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. And he who swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits on it. So they, were, they had made up these rules that if you swore by the temple, you didn't have to keep that promise. But if you swore by the gold of the temple, well, then in the court of law uh, among the Jews, you'd have to keep that one. Just foolishness. And Jesus points that out. You're telling me the gold is more important than the temple? Isn't the temple what makes the gold special? You're telling me the gift on the altar is more important than the altar that makes the gift anything? So it was just games being played. And so Jesus said, don't play them. Just let your yes be yes. If someone says, will you give me something? You say yes or no. Don't say yes or you know, strike down one of my children. That's all evil. Why would you do that? Just say yes. James is saying the same thing. We ought not to swear vows and oaths like that. Let's just be people of our word. Yes is yes and no is no. Verses 13 through 16. <clears throat> What's it about? It was all about making God the center of our lives. Is anyone among you suffering? Okay, well, what's the most important thing to do? Well, clearly I need to uh, sign up for some healthcare system and go to... No, now that may be a thing you need to do, and it is a thing you need to do. But no, the first thing you need to do, the most important thing is let him pray. 
Why? Because for a Christian, God is the center of our lives. And if that's the case, I'm ill, I pray to God. And then I'll seek medical attention. But first is first. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Okay? Not just whistle zippity doo dah, which is a great song, but let him give thanks to God. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of the faith will save the sick. Now, this is dated, right? They believed in the ancient time, and to a degree it's true, that the anointing with oil, covering someone who's with oil, olive oil, would make them healthier. You remember when the Samaritan found the man who had been beaten by the robbers, one of the things he did was anoint him with oil to try and help his wounds. Um, we don't do that anymore. We have, I'm going to say better medicines. They are better medicines now than they had back then. But all he's saying is, again, if you're sick in this day, first thing you need to do is call the elders and let them try to help you because that's the most important thing. If there's a doctor they know, then great. That could be a, another part of the procedure. Um, it's all about having God be first in your mind. Because remember, uh, check before ended with people thinking, well, I'm going to go tomorrow and do this and that. And he said, you, you don't know that. You should say, Lord willing, tomorrow you do that because maybe God has something else in mind because God is first. Here, he's talking about every aspect of your life. You know, are you, are you sick? Pray to God. Are you unhappy? Um, pray to God. Are you happy? Sing songs of thanks to God. God is to be the center and the focus of our lives. Verse 16, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. This is a difficult thing. Now, this is not saying that we have to, everything we do wrong, we have to go tell all of our brethren about it. But it is talking about the power of prayer to God for our sins and confessing to our brethren to help us with our sin. I always use the example of Sunday-itis. There are some brethren that have a hard time getting to the assembly. Um, maybe it's they're not morning people, and Sunday morning comes and they're tired. Maybe they were up too late Saturday, and, well, I don't know, you know, my shoulder's a little sore, and <coughs> maybe, maybe I'll just stay in bed this morning. You know, around one o'clock, they seem to be all better. But so Sunday itis is a thing. It's something to be prayed about to God. I'm sorry I'm disobeying you and not assembling with the, with the saints, Father. But then there's another step, if you really want to take care of this, is to confess that to other brethren and let them know, I really struggle getting here Sunday morning. Because now you've offered a grace to your brethren to help you with that. We all have weaknesses. So now I know, and I've had this happen in my life, where on Sunday morning, I'm going to give a call, you know, uh, a half hour before I leave for worship, I'm going to give a brother a call and say, how you doing? You doing all right? Do you need a ride? I'm going to make it so easy. You just got to, you know, stumble out to the, to the curb and I'll pick you up. Why? Because you've confessed this problem to me and I'm going to help you overcome that problem. Again, when God is the center of our lives, this is how Christians act. Not talking evilly about each other, right? Chapter 3 and chapter 4 of James. But quite the contrary, helping, bearing one another's burdens. Verses 17 and 18. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Remember in verse 16, he would said, um, pray for one another. Pray about your sins, asking forgiveness, because the fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. There's power in prayer. God answers prayer. We'll do a little mini sermonette here real quick. God always answers prayer. The problem is, and the reason some people think he doesn't answer prayer, is sometimes the answer to our prayer is no. God, give me a billion dollars. No, it would ruin you. Did you not read about all the things I said about the rich and the struggle of the rich to try to be saved? 
That would ruin you. I'm not going to give you that. It's not that God isn't answering our prayers. It's he's giving us the best answer, and it's not an answer we really want. God answers prayers with yes. He answers prayers with no. He answers prayers sometimes with not right now. Yes, but not right now. God, I really want to do X. And then it doesn't happen. But maybe it's because it's got to happen later at another time. And the last way God answers prayer is by saying, yes, but in the way you didn't expect. Paul wanted to go to Rome, didn't he? He prayed that he would go to Rome. In the letter, uh, chapter 1 of Romans, he talks about how he wanted so much. And in the last chapter, or chapter 15, he talks about how much he wants to come to them. I can't wait to come see you and, and, and um, give a, a spiritual gift. Uh, I, I just can't wait to do that, to be strengthened by your faith, and I can strengthen your faith. But he even said, I've been hindered until now. I've wanted to come, but I keep getting hindered, and I can't come to you. Well, God made him wait, kind of the third way he answers, and then God sent him to Rome in chains as a prisoner, right, of Rome. That's probably not how Paul was planning on going to Rome, but it got him there, and it got him access even to the family, the household of Caesar, and he was able to convert some. So God always answers prayers. So this is an admonition to pray. So common. Brethren, if you're struggling, if you're struggling with emotions, if you're struggling with relationships within the church, even without the church, I'm telling you the truth. I do not lie. Pray. Pray to God about the situation. Pray to God for the person you're struggling with. And you will come to a better place. Your relationship will be stronger with that person even if they don't change at all because your mindset will have changed because you will have brought God into the picture. And when he's in the picture, all is well. Last section, verses 19 and 20. Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. The epitome of Christ-likeness. The epitome of our service to Christ is turning the lost to the saved. Especially someone who is saved but who has wandered away from the truth. A sheep that has been collected but then wanders away to bring one back. That's the height of our service to Christ. Do <clears throat> you remember what Jesus said in Luke 15? Well, let's go ahead and read it for emphasis. Luke 15, verses 7 and 10. Jesus said, I say to you, that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Um, verse 10. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 8. And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Remember, he said if you turn someone back from the error of their ways, that will cover a multitude of sins. The blood of Christ, they can be forgiven. Here, love is the motivating factor for us to reach out and do that. That's the most Christ-like, our service. It's love. Why do we reach out to somebody that has Sundayitis? Because we want to make ourselves feel superior? No, because we love this person. We want them to be saved. Why do we reach out to people in the world who don't have Christ in the world? Because we're busybodies and we want to get in everybody's business? No, it's because we love them, because God loves them, and we want them to turn back. Love can cover a multitude of sins with the blood of Christ by preaching the truth and by living the truth. Jude, verse 23, talks about how we have to make a discerning among the brethren, and some we have to 
gently encouraged back into the fold and some we got to grab by the scruff of the neck and, and, and drag him kicking and screaming back into the fold. We had to know the difference between. That's what James is saying here. He's letting us know the epitome of Christ's likeness is saving a soul from death and allowing the blood of Christ, the grace of God, to cover a multitude of sins. It's a great chapter. It starts by condemning the oppressors, giving comfort to the oppressed. And then this section of remember who you are. Remember how you are. This is the way we act. Because when God is first and foremost in our life, this is what we do. Because remember, that's kind of been a theme through all of James. Worldliness. Wanting to be double-minded. Oh, I love God, but, but I'm, I'm also of the world. You've got to be all in, right? Uh, I could go on and on, but I shan't. Uh, that concludes our study of the book of James. Uh, next week, uh, we will do a review, and I will read the book in total so that we can get the fullness from that letter. Let's uh, conclude by going to our God in prayer. Kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this day and for the life that you've given us to live. Father, thank you so much for this word that strengthens us and gives us all things that we need unto life and godliness. May we always study it. May we always take advantage of the wonderful knowledge and wisdom that's available there for the saving of our souls. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Take care, brethren. I hope to see you soon.